So hello, my name is Kim Sauer at SMT AI um, in Chicago and I'm joined by a great panel today. We're going to be talking about cleaning before you put on your coat. Um, so it's all about um, cleaning in this industry and conformal coating. So I've got a great panel here. I've got um, actually Peter, Dan and Tom, really easy um, from uh, different aspects of the industry. So I'm going to go straight in there. Lots of things happening in, in the industry at the moment and one of the great drivers uh, that you're seeing across all industries is miniaturization. Now that has huge influences on how you clean as well as conform coat. So can you just give us an overview of what type of challenges you're facing with, with this trend of min miniaturization and maybe other trends that are actually affecting the processes? If I can start with you. Sure, why not? So I mean, from the standpoint of applying conformal coating anyway, uh, you know, the bigger problem when you go to smaller and smaller components is you have much tighter gaps that you have to make sure that you're filling under or ensuring that you're not going to have those air gaps growing and then escaping. Um, so from our standpoint, you know, obviously there's different ways to combat that, uh, whether that's thinning out the material with more of the solvent to be able to push it under, or using temperature gradients to be able to help kind of encourage the material to flow underneath. Um, certainly proper cleaning is a big part of that since surface energy and surface tension is a big part of uh, really making sure you get proper application. I'm sure that, uh, I'm not sure what you guys take some of that from your parts industry rather than just the formal coating. Well it's it's interesting because you know miniaturization is taking a number of different forms, right? Certainly well, they've decided our phones aren't going to get smaller anymore, right? Our, our phones are back to getting bigger now. They're actually getting bigger, uh, yeah. So, so this is going to sort of a reverse uh, counterintuitive flow there. But uh, of course, the power that's inside is, is increasing dramatically and the sophistication of what's in there likewise. But with these new bottom termination components, you know, from, from one perspective, I think on the coating side, it's a bit easier because they're a little bigger, but yet what's going on underneath them is tremendously challenging on the cleaning side. You know, they've got those big lugs, you know, ground lugs in the middle and lots of a very low gap. You know, when you talk about gap, you're talking about gap between components. When we talk about gap, we're talking about gap under the component. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we've got to get in there, not just to fill it, but to remove all those contaminants. And then, of course, make sure there's no residues left behind. So that those dynamics are really, we're doing a lot of research right now on What's, what's life like underneath those bottom termination components? Because they're getting super popular and, uh, and they're um, not always the easiest thing to clean. Now the underneath side maybe isn't quite the challenge on the, con the, con the formal coating application side, but then we've got the other dynamic of, of a coating situation where you know, we're kind of, you know, there's an old, old joke about, you know, why do you clean a fishbowl? Well, it's because both ends of the fish live in the fishbowl. <laughs> and that's why you clean your fishbowl, right? And, and, and the reality is once I put the coating on something, whatever's left is there. Yeah, and, it, and it's in a bit of a contained environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, not perfectly contained, but relatively contained, right. which you know, could be problematic. I was going to ask one question. Do you find that a lot of customers will actually coat their parts and then come back to you to say, I need to remove this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we definitely have that. I mean, ideally, that's going to be when they've made a mistake rather than part of the process, but you know that is actually one of the more common questions I would receive back about our conformal coatings, uh, especially because a lot of our conformal coatings are mill specs. Uh, they've been used for years, decades, you know, there's, for the most part they have that process down, it's when they do make that mistake, whether it's off ratio or they didn't quite get the coverage and solving the trapping. Getting it off the board is, is much more difficult, especially with the high resistant polyurethane materials that we use. The acrylics are pretty easy a lot to easy remove, to work yeah. with, but you know, with the uh, especially the cross link two part uh, C1155 material, I know that that's a common issue that we run into, and the question becomes, um, you know, obviously heat's an option. Uh, then you have the chemical stripper option. And it's a matter of what can the components take to, and that's where we kind of turn to, to some of the guys on the chemical side, being the experts of what would work with those components versus also still removing the materials. Yeah, and those two parking components are tough. They really are. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. Are there different methods of cleaning that you now need to apply maybe to, to the to, to the tighter, uh, well, to, to the miniaturization issue? The different ways of cleaning that, that guarantees better cleaning maybe that then alleviates the problems that you've mentioned? I think uh, with Microcare we have a couple of different options for cleaning. Uh, one of them is a bench top option. 
so people can actually clean the circuit board in a, in a rework or, or a spot area. And then also we have, you know, um, cleaning for high volume, which is vapor degreasing. And then vapor degreasing, you put the cleaning fluid in, which is the chemistry, and um, it has low surface tension. It can get under some parts and come back out uh, fairly easily. Uh, but the, the smaller the parts are getting, like you mentioned, the miniaturization is still becoming an issue even for solvent cleaning. It does get under the parts and come back out, so we've had some success even with the low standoff. And, and there's a lot of dimensions there. I mean, the, you know, cleaning has has evolved a lot over the years, and, and vapor degreasing is a piece of the puzzle. Aqueous these days is, is, you know, sort of the dominant technology. And even the different solvents that aren't vapor degreasing things are still floating around out there. And and the, the challenge is also that the you know when when we're cleaning, you know, some of the stuff that we're cleaning hasn't changed. You know, a little dust and dirt somebody's fingerprints, you know, that's kind of the same as it's been forever. Uh, now the Flux guys, on the other hand, have been very, very uh, industrious uh, in inventing new materials that, on a constant basis to improve performance for the, for the soldering process, right? So, you know, one of the dilemmas we have, one of the challenges of the, of the cleaning world that we're in is, you know, we're a, uh, we, we have, we're a response variable and that, the solder guys change their solder, and their new their customers are happy, and our materials don't work. Well, then our customers need to find happiness somewhere else, right? So that's unfortunate. So we're constantly working on new blends and new materials and new delivery systems to, to try to figure out how do we stay in sync with that constant drumbeat of development, all to the goal of a essentially residue-free surface that then doesn't screw up the coating process. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. I'm actually curious about is do you guys run into issues with um, you know finding something that's compatible with moving our materials and the coatings themselves but still not having a negative impact on the components? Well you know those markings are sensitive little devils. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I would say also that we do have you know problems with that. So I think the more the more we can you know evaluate the coating and the different types of coatings you have out there, I think the better solution we could probably provide. And, and particularly with the two-part systems. You know, with the acrylics, they're, they're not all that difficult to remove. I mean, it's a, it might be a bit messy, but it's not. It, and, and those materials tend not to have much much uh, incompatibility issue with the, with the substrates. When you're, when you're really, you know, you're, you're kind of not baking cakes when you're taking those two-part materials off. Therefore, you're bringing a much more active agent into the game, and as soon as your coating's gone, well, it's still there working on now what's next. Because, you know, as far as the cleaning coat is concerned, you know, ink is just another contaminant between it and the surface beneath it. So, if and inks, if they're not put on properly, and, and generally they are, but they're not always put on properly, you know, you can have an issue there. But that's why, you know, that's, that's the dimension. You know, those people that wind up doing a lot of rework tend to go with the acrylics because they can get there from here, right. you know. So there's, you know, that's one of the dynamics in, in your world. That you know, how do people balance that? It, it's a bit mysterious to us, I right. suspect. Yeah, everybody wants it to go on and stay on, but they want to be able to get it off. Yeah. It's got to be reworkable, yeah. right? That's right. And uh, you know, and and much like again, those you know those those inks are are contaminants fundamentally. So if we clean too well, we remove those, and that's bad. So it's you know all that work to make sure we're compatible with those, and not just the inks on the parking, but you know on the labels. You know, everybody's got multiple labels on all their parts these days. And, and once again, there's a, there's a lot of opportunity for the user to mis, mix, miss and match those things. You know, there's an ink that's supposed to be thermally cured, but they put it on after it comes out of the oven, so it doesn't get thermally cured, and then it gets cleaned, then all the ink disappears. Um, you know, this, this is a life experience that you're quite familiar yeah. with. Yeah, yeah me too. Um, you know, so it, that, that those are opportunities for error. That, that we have to work with, you know, to, with the customers to help them try to, to stay away from that stuff, right? picking the right materials. Mm -hmm. So how clean is clean? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about different industries and when we're talking about military, when we're talking about um, automotive, for example, and you really don't want that contamination because that can, you know, literally lead to, to death in the worst case. Absolutely. Um, how, how, do, how do you deal with cleanliness levels or requirements um, and how would that interact with the type of conformal coating, uh, coating applications that you then use? Yeah, I think our customers are, you know, we're not going to tell them how clean their parts are, 
we're going to clean them, and then they're going to let us know whether or not they're satisfied. But there are standards for cleaning, mm. and also uh, different test methods to ensure that your part is clean. Mm. And um, usually the customers will run their circuit boards through one of those types of tests, like an SIR test or Ionic, and um, be able to get results to, to tell them whether or not the board is clean. And then it gets to a certain point where it is clean enough, and then it will go to the next uh, stage of the process of the coating. So cleaning is, the, is the, you know, very important before the coating process. And, and there's, there's actually, right this minute, there's a lot of work going on in the standards committees on that very question. Not, it, it, part of that discussion is, gee, is there a number that's just magic and sort of seemingly out of the air? And the answer is probably no. Right. Um, but there's also, what's the right method? You know, some some of the methods are, you know, of course, when we're in production, we're making, you know, part of project one or whatever, but we kind of like to check that one, right, to see if it's okay. Right. But, you know, if you're doing SIR, well, you can't really do that, right? You got to do that on a test card, so there's a, there's a little there's a little sunlight there. People have used the, the old rose testers for years, but, you know, they were really designed to dissolve rosin flux 40 years ago, which they did a great job of, but nobody uses it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's they're, they're a bit superfluous, even though they're commonly used and they're readily available. That That's all going on in the standards world. We're not going to figure that out. Uh, and they're making decisions about how does that ex how does how do we bring better definition to that? Because especially nowadays, since the OEMs, other than in the in the military world, don't do much of their production anymore, right? It's all it's a threat to CM. Um, you know, they don't always know what they need. They don't always know what clean looks like. They're they're trying to hit some reliability number. And okay, let's 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 put it in an ECM machine and let it run for two months. And I guess that means it's good. Um, you know, it's a, it's a vague area. Frankly, in the, in the industrial world, metal world, there's a host of metrics and numbers and things that are commonly used. Uh, and even in those spaces, people get confused. You know, when we're here, there really aren't any good numbers other than 40-year-old numbers that everybody knows don't apply except they're all we got, so I guess it's okay. Mm -hmm. it's always done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, literally back to the 70s. Yeah, okay. It's when that stuff was dreamed up. Okay and things look a little different. So would you say, therefore, we're coming to the end of the time that we've got together, it's quite, quite, quite a broad subject to, to discuss, but therefore, based on, on that answer, would you say that we need to work on standards a lot more enable, uh, to enable uh, better results in the end and, and, and a more, I, I don't know, cooperative uh, result at the end of it? So is standards what we need to go forward? I don't know. I mean, I think from my standpoint, that's difficult question to answer because it really comes down to, it depends on the criticality of the application, uh, you know, who's using it, how they're using it, what it's going to go into. And that goes back to the fact that, you know, in most situations, they basically have to go ahead and test it after they've gone through the clean process and see if it really is giving them the results that they need. And I think that that's a difficult question to answer and to quantify. So is it collaboration between the cleaners and the, the coaters? that needs to be strengthened maybe as well. That, that's certainly a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because again, if if the, the if anything that's left behind lives inside that coating, which if, if it wasn't coated, which would cause a different problem, all right, well maybe that wouldn't be overly benign, but now that I'm capturing, you know, stick it in a little cave, uh, I can increase the risk factor there. So mm -hmm. coatings are, are becoming much more popular than they were five or 10 years ago. That's a trend that is, unlikely to change, I think. Um, so yeah, I think it's very important that we we all understand those dimensions and, and help the customers learn because they don't always know. And uh, you know, because they don't know it, and when you come back to standards, I think in this case, you know, many of the standards are a standard methodology, right? It's not necessarily a standard so everything comes out so tall. And, and I believe that, that the industry is going to need to, to kind of gravitate toward some methodology that comes up with, okay, if you do this, you get the 20,000 life cycles or whatever the heck the number might be. Uh, and it's it's really not there now. Um, and maybe this discussion on the rows will trigger that. Because that's there's a lot of that discussion going on in one of the core standards that kind of affects everybody. Mm -hmm. So maybe that'll be the next, hopefully that'll be the next leg on that discussion. Okay. I think collaborating and partnering with you know, the people you see here something that we need to continue to do because at the end of the day like Tom mentioned we're helping the customer yeah. so that, and that's what
really our goal. And it's certainly a trend that we're seeing throughout the industry. More and more companies collaborating in an industry 4.0 world um, and thus improving reliability and ultimately what the customer needs. Thank you very much for your time, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.